and let me make sure this is all good. <laughs> all right, so The Masked Empire, Chapter 6. The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks, Chapter 6. Thrin had learned a lot from the thieves in the weeks since the bastard Shemlin had killed his friend Lemmet. First, he learned that most of the laws he feared so much could be walked around with laughable ease. Elves in Halam Sharal were forbidden to carry any blade longer than the palm of their hand, but half of the elves in the Thieves Guild wore blades at their hips for all to see, a dare to any guardsman with the courage to start a fight. Second, he learned that his job at the tannery put him in high regard. With the leather scraps he stole, he could make slings for rebels who otherwise had nothing. Arrows and bolts could be hard to come by, the thieves told Thren, but even the damn Shems couldn't keep the elves from getting their hands on the rocks. What was more, when the rebels came to Thren with leather skins, he showed them how to boil them and shape them into armored plates and greaves. They weren't pretty, but they might turn away a blade or slow down an arrow. Third, he learned, much to his surprise, that he really liked killing humans. The wagon had reached the trader's square just past sundown. It was a marketplace used mostly by craftsmen and merchants, hauling food, not as fancy as the ones in the protected upper part of Halam Sharal, but several steps cleaner and prettier than the ones in the slums where the elves had lived. Simple sheets of canvas were hung to make stalls around the square itself, painted brightly with dragons and chevaliers, and in the middle of a square, a raised platform gave bards or other performers a good place to earn a few coins. Human guards had searched the wagon, grunting, then warned the driver to be quick about up unloading his goods. The filthy elves had been thieving more as of late, they said, and even the, mo the good parts of the city weren't safe. Thren watched and listened from a rooftop across the square, then passed a signal to the runner Lemmet had died to protect. The child shot Thren a smirk, then scampered off. Thren watched and listened from a rooftop across the square, then passed a signal to the runner Lemmet. Oh, sorry. Thren counted to 100, then stood. He dropped a stone into the sling, spun the leather strap at the wrist, and let it fly. The stone hurtled across the square, lost to view. Thren saw the guard stumble back clutching at the shoulder of his chainmail as the clank of stone on metal carried back to Thren's ears. More slung stones followed from all across the square. Merchants ran screaming as the stones fell like hail, rattling and cracking on cobblestones and armor and flesh. And the guards spun, raising crossbows and squinting in the twilight for targets. The horses buckled, bucked and screamed, and their driver fought to keep them from bolting. Thren spun his sling and loosed another stone, then swore. He'd only been practicing for a few weeks now, but he could tell as soon as it left his hand that it would go wide. A sharp buzz snapped past Thren's ear, and he felt the wind as a bolt hissed past his face, crackling, cracking into the wall of the building behind him. A few weeks ago, that would have had Thren cowering on the ground in terror. Tonight, he bared his teeth with a feral grin. A moment later, the guard who had fired at him fell to his knees, bleeding from his face. The square was almost empty. The guards were on the ground, dazed if not dead, and it would be a few precious minutes before reinforcements arrived. One of the thieves yelled out a command, and Thren swung over the side of the rooftop, then dropped to the ground. He landed awkwardly, his ankle rolling under him as he landed. Swearing, he scrambled back to his feet and kept moving with the rest. He tucked his sling back into his belt and pulled his knife free as he and the other thieves strolled, strolled boldly into the square. Please, please, I have a family. A merchant had dropped to his knees, his head bloodied, and scrambled out of the way as Thren approached. Thren cuffed him on the head grinned at one of the other elves, and kept going. 
The guard who fired a bullet at him was still on his knees, shaking his head. Thren walked up behind the man, grabbed him by the shoulder, and slid his dagger up under the jaw and across the man's throat. The guard fell, gurgling and clutching at his throat. He'd hesitated. The first time he'd killed a guard like that. The guard had gotten his own knife out, and one of the more experienced thieves had saved Thren's life, then jeered him loudly for the rest of the evening. The second time, Thren had lunged in the mad, awkward energy of a young man in a woman's bed for the first time, and he'd ended up stabbing a guard up under the ear. It had taken the poor bastard minutes to die, and Thren had been too nervous to retrieve his dagger until the man stopped moving. The third time, however, Thren had gotten it right, and in the weeks since, many more had followed. One smooth motion, not jerky, not too fast, was all it took to make the human guard who'd sneered at the elves for so long a corpse on the ground. Elves were already beating the, dri the wagon driver, who was curled up on the ground. Thren ignored them and joined the ones checking in the wagon. Food and cooking pots, most of it, said one of them as Thren approached. Some lamp oil. Thren nodded. Lamp oil would burn, and cooking pots could make weapons. What do we take? asked another one. No time to get all of it. Thren looked at the horses, which were whining in alarm, and pulling at their harnesses. We take it all. Who here can drive a wagon? At the silence, Thren frowned, then turned to the elves beating the driver. Get him on his feet! They growled, but did as Thren ordered, pulling the wagon driver up. He had a bloody nose and stood in a crouch, curled around him in self in pain, but nothing looked broken. Do you want to live, Shem? He asked, keeping his voice hard. Drive the wagon where we tell you, and you'll walk out alive. The man took a breath and coughed. What about the horses? He asked. Thren laughed. It came out louder than he intended. The heat of the fight was still on him. You're not in a really good place to bargain, human. The driver took another breath, wincing. No, I know. But you're not going to kill the horses, right? You'll treat them well? Thren looked at the other elves, who shrugged. We had no plans to hurt them. All right, said the driver, and limped to the wagon. Thren waved to the rest of the thieves, and they grabbed what they could and ran. Thren and a few others joined the wagon driver and led him back into the slums. The square behind them was silent, but for the groans of the merchants they'd left alive. At Thren's orders, the driver pushed the horses. They reached the barricade that the elves had set up around the little corner of Halam Sharal, and with a great shout, the elves pulled aside tables and planks of wood along one wall so that the wagon could pass. The horses whinnied, whined in alarm at the sharp planks that jutted from the side of the barricade. Bits of garbage turned into a makeshift wall against the humans, and the driver barked at them and cracked the reins, then shot Thren an apologetic look. Thren ignored him. The elven slums, slums had changed in the past few weeks. Every block had a building or two that was blackened from a punitive visit from the guards. The markets had hoarded, boarded their doors, and instead of horses and cooking food, the slums now smelled of smoke. But for all that, Thren saw happiness too. An elven girl ran alongside the wagon for a moment, and when one of the thieves tossed her a stolen apple. When the humans had decided when and how the elves ate, that girl might have starved. Now, when the humans cut off supplies as a punitive measure, the elves fought for the every bite, and they ate better. The headquarters for the elven rebellion was the tavern where Thren and Lemmet had gone drinking on that fateful night. Now. Most of the tables had been taken out back and chopped up for wooden shields, and the sawdust on the floor was stained with blood from injured elves who lay on pallets near the old bar, 
On one wall, the elves had drawn a map of the city in charcoal, noting possible targets, escape routes, and places to hide. Ren hopped down from the wagon, wincing at the ankle he twisted in the fight, and left the others to unload it. Jeanette, still wearing her ser server's apron, weighed him over, her lips pursed with nervous tension. Be careful, Jeanette said, wiping her hands nervously on her server's apron as Thren came inside. They're dangerous. Thren didn't need to be told. The elven woman sitting on the bar before him wore better armor than he'd ever seen. It was leather, but blue as the waking sea and trimmed with silver studs, and she moved as if it weighed, it weighed no more than linen. The bow slung over her shoulder was made from a wood he didn't recognize, with a fine world pattern along the curve that remind him, reminded Thren of leaves, and the daggers at her waist shone with a blue-white glitter of silverite. Thren was more, there was more coin hanging from that elf than Thren had made in his entire life. But the elven man next to her was even more terrifying. His cloak was simple, as were his breeches and tunic, and his feet were bare. He could have been a beggar, except for the glowing staff he held, and the intricate pattern of tattoos that marked his face. The staff marked him as a mage, not safely locked away in the circle tower, but standing right in the warehouse with no Templars to stop him from doing whatever he wanted. The tattoos marked him a legend. Haren, Thren said haltingly, remembering the old world words. Honored Elder, have you come to help us fight for freedom? We have come, said the elven woman to stop you from getting yourselves killed. Empress Selene's forces moved towards Halam Sharal at a grueling pace. They had crossed the waking sea by ship, then made their way through Lides. It meant that Dute Remek, Remek's servants, would have a full view to report back to their master, and through him, to Gaspard. But there was no way. But there was no helping it. And in truth, she did not want to help it. Gaspard had driven her to this, thinking himself clever in forcing the Empress of Orlais to crush a rebellion and prove that she was not to be trifled with. Let the nobles see what she would do once spurred to action, and let them never again mistake reluctance for war with inability to safeguard the Empire. While her forces, a few hundred horses, twice that in footmen, and two score chevaliers, rode or marched. Selene sat in the royal coach, reading intelligent reports and wishing she could be riding. She wore a gown fit for travel, and her mask lay on the seat beside her, to be worn if she left the coach. Riding would obviously be far more comfortable. Though Selene spent time on horseback regularly, a gentle ride in the park or a few hours hunting were nothing compared to spending all day in the saddle and she knew it. But in the saddle, she would simply be riding. She would not spend all day reading reports. How many blocks of the shems had the elves taken? How many blocks of the slums had the elves taken? How many guards were dead? How many nobles had changed their plans because of this threat to the city? In the coach, she had nothing else to do but read, give orders, and wait. Sir Michelle was inside with her, impassive as she glared at the page pages. News, Majesty? he asked, as she crumpled a note into a ball. Nothing new, Michelle. The elves had taken a few more bluffs, blocks. They now encroached into streets where the poor humans lived, and they had driven out those poor peasants with whatever they could carry. Elves and Lides were reportedly fleeing their city to reach the freedom of Halam Sharal, and the rebels in Halam Sharal had left notes demanding that Lord Mainsarai be given to them for justice. Halam Sharal's guard forces, often stripped bare to deal with more troubling areas, requested aid. How long? Michelle glanced out the window, squinting. If we keep this pace, with minimal rest, less than the day. 
though that, ha- that has us arriving at Halam Sharal tired. They are elves, Michelle. Their armor is scavenged from scrap metal and leather, and they are throwing rocks at the guards. This will be an easy enough battle, provided we arrive soon. He nodded without speaking, and Celine saw him frown. He looked more puzzled than concerned, which was a relief. She trusted Michelle's judgment in all matters of war, and if he were worried, she would be as well. Do you disagree, Michelle? No. Your pardon, Majesty. He shook his head. I wonder at their foolishness. To sneak out after curfew is one thing. To kill guards and raise barricades? What could they have been thinking? They were hungry and afraid. Selene shrugged. Some nobles are cruel to the poor creatures without need. Even a dog will learn to bite if it's kicked enough. Michelle raised an eyebrow. You almost sound sorry for them. She smiled sadly. I had hoped to solve this in a different way, Michelle. The elves belong to this empire. They have their place in it, as surely as you and I. And it is my duty before the Maker to provide them guidance, safety, and comfort. What I do now, I do with a heavy heart. She looked at him curiously. And you? His expression didn't change. They have threatened your rule. I would sooner put down a few hundred knife ears rather than allow Gaspar to endanger the lives of men. I have never seen such anger from you, Michelle. Something in her breast twinge, loyalty to Briala. For all that she knew, her lover could be brokenhearted at what Selene would have to do at Halam Sharal. She thought of their last talk before Briala le- had left, of the passion in her lover's voice. And it is unworthy of you, I think. The elves are peasants. We can no more appreciate the joys and hardships of their lives than they could ours. In their minds, we spend all day eating rare delicacies and all night at Grand Balls. Michelle chuckled at that. That is likely true, Majesty. They have not insulted you with this rebellion. You need bear them no anger. I know, Majesty. But as I said, they rebelled against you. Breaking a law I can understand, even if all law is ultimately your law. But directly moving against you? He shrugged. I cannot understand a peasant, elf, or human willingly doing that, and I must react. If I cannot do that, then how can I claim to be your champion? Celine shook her head. You will have your chance, Michelle. I pray that we will succeed. They sat in silence, and Celine thought that night again she would sleep alone. But Gaspard would sleep with fear as his companion. Rebels though they might be, the elves were Orlesians, and their deaths demand recompense. Gaspard would pay. Lord Main Sarai's home was in the city was almost a palace, a great estate set behind stone walls and spiked iron gates. As the half moon rose, Briala watched the estate from the shadows of the trees in the nearby park. The windows were dark, and the gates had been closed for more than an hour now, any visitors having long since departed. The smoke coming from many chimneys had largely tapered off, except for one end of the house that Briella had picked out as likely being the kitchens. A few servants might be up and about still, working in the kitchen or laundering linens for tomorrow. But most of the house had gone to bed. Thalassin leaned against a tree beside her, calm as always. The apparent leader of the rebellion, Thren, paced nervously behind them. You are certain that this is the way? He asked for the third time. The only way, Briella said, trying to keep her voice calm. Did you think you could burn buildings and kill guards with impunity? No, but... The Empress will send Chevaliers into the slums and burn everything inside your barricades to the ground," Flassen said, still leaning against the tree. That is, generally speaking, 
what empresses do when someone throws up a barricade and announces that they're rebelling. So if you want justice, Brielle continued, if you want Main Sarai dead, then it needs to happen now. While the rebels cause a distraction across the city. And once he is dead, then you need to stay quiet. The guards need to see the elves behaving themselves perfectly tomorrow morning. No more raids, no more thrown stones, nothing but a polite smile and eyes down. Do you understand? But in the darkness, Thren was just a gray blur of motion, but she could smell his sweat. Do you think they'll just find his body and then shrug? What if they ride into the slums and demand answers? They almost certainly will, Flossen said. And nobody will have seen anything, Brielle added. Thren stopped pacing and turned to them. What if they kill elves in retribution? They almost certainly will, Flossen said again. And you will keep your eyes down and your mouths shut, Brielle said. But, but, you're Dalish, Thren turned to Flassen desperately. Your people could reclaim Halam Sharal for the elves. Yes, someday, Flassen pushed himself off from the tree, but not today. Today, you kill a noble and then hope all the other nobles think he was too great an ass to be worth avenging. You don't understand. Thren's voice rose in his anger. People joined the cause because I told them about Lemmet. Because of me. Now you're saying that the best we can hope for is to have a few homes burned, a few elves killed? I know it's not what you want to hear, Brielle said. And Thren turned on her. Shut up! Don't you walk away in your fancy armor and your bath-scented skin and act like you know what we've been through? He took a ragged breath and stalked away. Briar let him go. When he was done, he let out a slow breath and rolled the tension out of her shoulders. Well, I thought that went well. How about you, Delenn? Flassen asked behind her. He's right, Briar shrugged, watching the moon clear the rooftops. I grew up serving Celine. However I was treated, it was more gently than if I'd been in the alienage. Maker's breath, I live in the palace in Val Royale. And it's just been one giant holiday for you, hasn't it? Flassen's hand came to rest on her shoulder. Ah, oh, wait, no. You spend all your time spying for the Empress and urging her to help these elves in a hundred ways they would never notice. Brella nodded without answering. The words were true, but it didn't tighten the knots in her stomach. Or, ha, uh, Flassen chuckled. The hand on her shoulder tightened, pulling her around. In the moonlight, his eyes were deeper spots of black. You're not sure which it is, are you? Are you really doing this to help the elves, to help save elven lives? Or are you doing it to, to protect your empress? The two are inseparable, Briella said without hesitation. I know that Gaspard would not be gentle with the elves, and I cannot put words in his ear. She unslung her bow and stepped out from the trees, Flossen beside her. This is the only way. Flossen grinned. Well, good. Let's stop moping and go kill a, a noble, then. Ahead of them, at the edge of the lawn, Thren waited. Brel looked at him, the elven crusader fighting for his dead friend, and asked, could the Dalish help these people? Flassen was silent for a long moment. I doubt we'll ever know, he finally said. Why not? Because, Flassen said. The Dalish will never see the point. Are you ready? Thren called over, forestalling any other questioning Briala might have asked. If you are... Brielle drew an arrow from her quiver. Let us win justice for your people. Flassen crossed the road, his steps even and unhurried, and came to the stone wall of Main 
Lord Main Sarai's estate. It was twelve feet high, with foot-long iron spikes jutting out and down to deter would-be thieves along the shards of broken glass set at top of the wall. Flasson laid a hand to the stone wall, closed his eyes, and let out a long breath. A rumble started in Briella's belly and worked its way to her ears, and they popped as the stones of Lord Mainsurai's wall shifted. The metal spike shrieked, and the loose rocks shot out from stonework with sharp cracks. The wall around Flasson sagged, as though it were a snow fort melting in the spring sun, and his hand glowed with pale green light. Briella winced as one of the spikes, warped by the twisting of the rock wall behind it, tore away and clanged to the ground. I thought this would be quieter. You thought wrenching metal and stone apart would be quick quieter? Really? Blasson pulled his hand away. As dogs began barking all throughout the neighborhood, he added, Shall we depart? Where he had cast his spell, the wall had sunk, and it formed a canyon just a few feet high. All around it, the stone was, stone was stretched, the iron spikes jutting at irregular angles like some great monster's teeth. Brielle stepped gingerly over the gap, her bow raised. Inside, the lawn was neatly trimmed, and hedges had been sculpted into the shape of dragons and griffins and other beasts. Past the lawn, the manor itself was elaborate and overwrought. Its clean white columns lit magically to display bronze sculptures of Emperor Draken fighting Darkspawn. With Thren and Falassin behind her, Brielle crept into the shadow of a majestic wyvern, and then darted across the lawn to take refuge behind beneath a griffin's outstretched wings. Who's there? came a cry from the house, near the house. Briella found the guard as he stepped out, looking at the wall in confusion. What in Maker's name? Her arrow took him in the throat, and he, he died without giving a cry. And then a second guard stepped out from behind a column, saw his comrade fell, fall, and let out a full-throated shout. Flasson flung out a hand, and a boulder the size of a wagon wheel tore itself from the earth and hurtled into the guard, smashing him against the stone column. He landed with his neck, twisted unnaturally, and didn't move. Damn it. Briella stepped out from the hedge. They'll be all over us in a minute. Well, don't blame me. I got mine. We need to go. Now. She took off towards the house at a sprint. She darted across the lawn, past the beautiful marble fountain where bronze nymphs cavorted, and up the staircase where the two dead guards laid. As she reached the top of the stairs, four guards rushed around the corner with swords and shields ready. For the elves! came Thren's cry from behind Briella, and a moment later a stone whipped past her and caught the lead guard on his breastplate, knocking him back onto his heels. They were armed and armored, and they outnumbered Briella, Briella's group four to three. Added to that, Briella knew that the longer they fought, the more attention they would draw. It would have to be quick. She ran forward, firing on the run as she did. Her arrows, one after another, split the air and glanced off iron breastplates. Fired from a half-draw on the run, they lacked the penetrating power necessary to punch through armor. But the guards stumbled and flinched, and Brielle's true arrow was already drawing back at the, as the guards fumbled with their shields. It took the lead guard in the leg, punching through armor, and he cried out and dropped to one knee. The next guard she saw an archer with no arrow in her bow and lunged in for the easy kill. She sidestepped and slid a dagger out of its sheath and up into his face in one smooth motion. He collapsed, shrieking, but Briella was already moving. No, you poor fools. Blasin said from behind her, and Briella flinched as lightning played off the body of the guard coming at Briella from the other side. He cried out and shuddered, paralyzed in the coils of magic, and then fell, his breastplate smoking. 
always going after the one closest to you and forgetting about the one in the back who can light you on fire. Brielle dropped her bow, drew a second dagger, and turned to the guard she hobbled first. He grimaced and swung at her, and she stepped back, then lunged in and finished him quickly, her silver eyed dagger slashing across his throat. She turned toward the last guard, only to see that he had been handled. Thren was cutting the man's throat with what looked like a rusty butcher's knife, favoring a small cut on his side. He saw her look and nodded once, face grim. Vlasen came up the stairs, his staff crackling with curls of en green energy. Go, he said. As your people drew the city guards elsewhere, I will draw Main Sarai's men out here. Without pausing, he leveled his staff at the guard Briala had blinded and finished him with a spear of emerald light. Briala retrieved her bow and slung it over her shoulder. She doubted there would be much time for shooting in the close confines of the manor. She nodded to Falassen, then quietly pulled open the great bronze door and crept inside with her blades raised. The lamps had been dimmed for the evening, and Briella squinted in the shadows. Her armor, soft drakeskin fitted specially for her slender flame, frame, let her move as softly as she'd been wearing a robe, and Thren moved with the quiet caution born in the slums. She had been in enough noble houses to know the general layout, and moved confidently to the stairs. Thren trailed behind her. At the top of the stairs, shadowed hallways glittered as art on the wall on the walls caught the moonlight. Ahead of Briala, a door opened with a tiny squeak of old metal, and a robed servant stepped out into the hall. She turned and saw them, and her moment made a tiny soundless oh. For a moment for a long moment, nobody moved. Briala looked at the woman an elf, at least sixty years old, in a tattered robe that would leave her too cold in the winter. The knuckles on her fingers were swollen into knots, and her graying hair had come free from the bun she'd stu stuck it into, hanging around the papery skin of her face. Wordlessly, the woman pointed to a room a few doors down. Then she gave Briala a tiny nod and backed into the room she'd come out of. The door closed softly, and Briella heard a lock click into place. And she serves him, Thren whispered, and shook his head. Briella moved towards the door, the soft leather soles of her boots making no noise on the carpeted floor. Quietly, Thren pulled the door open. The room inside must have been seemed impressive to Thren, Briella guessed, by his shot stare. To Briala, it spoke of someone with enough money to afford luxury, but no taste in how to spend it. Rodin furs hung next to Vinter statues and sculptures from the Anderfels. A jeweled dagger was half-sheathed carelessly on, carelessly on a nightstand, and a painting that looked in the dim moonlight like an original Cagliastri was hung on the wall so that it would see its colors leach by sunlight within a few years. Lord Main Sarai lay alone in a voluminous canopied bed, snoring softly. The Lord evidently preferred to sleep in the nude. Thren stared at the man who had killed his friend. For crimes against Lemon and the elven people, he began, and then broke off as Briala, who had never stopped walking in the first place, leaned over and slit Main Sarai's throat. What did you? I wanted him to know! Briella wiped her blade on the sheets and glanced at the body. I believe he just figured it out. Let's go. Thren glared at her. This was not your fight. That's why you needed me here, Briella said and sighed at his puzzled look. I know what you're feeling. I killed the noble woman who, got, who killed my parents. That got Thren's attention. I thought you were just some noble spy. No. Briella peeked out of the bedroom, checking the halls. She heard no sign of inside guards, but it was best to be sure. 
I am the Empress's spy. And because it was not quite a lie, and because Thren needed to hear it, she added, Empress Selene could not arrest Lord Mainsurai without incurring the anger of the other el nobles, but she wished to see justice done. She crept out of the hallway, Thren behind her. Both still had their daggers out. So she sends you to kill those who anger her? Thren asked. He had g the good sense to keep his voice down now that they were out of the bedroom. Yes. Brielle spent more time watching and listening than she did killing, but in the th 20 years Celine had ruled Orle, Briella had gotten her hand bloodied often enough. Like the noblewoman who killed your parents? No. She paused at a thump around, from around the corner, then relaxed when she saw that it was just a cat making its nightly rounds. That was for me. And that is why you needed me here. When I went after the noblewoman, my need for vengeance nearly got me killed. They moved quietly back down the stairs to the front parlor. Then I suppose I'm glad you were here, Thren said behind her. As am I, Briella smiled. She had done it. Briella hadn't allowed herself to think it before. When she'd ridden into town with Falassin and seen the poor elves who fancied themselves rebels. They'd built a barricade that any chevalier would vault over and wore badly tanned leather armor that an axe or halberd could cut through like it was satin, in their naivety. They had been talking about Halam Sharal belonging to the elves again. It was heartbreaking to see them so proud over so little. Unaware of how much trouble they had caused, or how close they had all come to death at the hands of the Imperial Army. That army would have crushed them in hours. If Celine had seen them in that moment, she would have withdrawn her permission in an instant, and Brielle would have been hard-pressed to argue. Brielle wondered what Gaspard was trying to make of the elven situation. He was too opportunistic to pass it up, and too crude to come up with something truly clever. With luck, he'd be speaking of it as a dire situation that needed a firm hand, so that when the situation inexplicably vanished, he'd look even more of the fool. Through the still open bronze doors ahead, the yard was quiet. Braille wondered if Falassin had dealt with all of Main Sarai's guards, but it seemed bright outside. Perhaps he'd lit something on fire? Brielle came outside and, blinking past the glare of torches, she saw a dozen armed men on horseback reined around her. In the name of Empress Selene, Sir Michelle's voice rang out, you are under the arrest. You are under arrest for the murder of Lord Main Sarai. For a moment she thought she had misheard, but when her eyes adjusted to the brightness, she saw the tabards of the men around her, the golden lion on a field of purple. She saw M Sir Michelle's face, grim and resolute, and at her stare, he only nodded. She had failed, after all. The lesson was nowhere to be seen, though great hunks of stone had been torn from the formerly pristine lawn, and some of the marble columns were scorched near crumpled bodies that marked more of Mainsarai's guards. I surrender. Swallowing the bite that rose up in her throat. Brielle dropped the daggers that held her hands up, showing her empty palms. The silver eyed blades struck the ground with a sound like glass breaking, though of course the blades themselves were fine. Several, several of the chevaliers glanced down at the sound, surprised that an elf would have such fine weapons. They would of course recognize the distinct sound, since all of them were nobles. Well, except for Michelle. Some dark and laughing part of her mind noted. Celine had given them to her on the night she had come back to her in Val Royale. It had been the first night they made love. Traitor! Thren yelled, and she couldn't deny the insult. He raised his knife with a wordless yell, and a dozen crossbow bolts tore through him. He was dead before he hit the ground. Sir Michelle dismounted and came forward with shackles ready. Sir Michelle, she said, 
We do keep running into each other in odd places. He said nothing. His face was grim and set, and after a moment, she realized what he feared. No, she said quietly. I would not spend it so fruitlessly. Even if he did hold to his word, the two of them versus El eleven chevaliers would be a short and one-sided battle. He still said nothing, but he nodded once, and the muscles of his neck relaxed slightly. It surprised her. It was unlikely that any of his fellow chevaliers would believe whatever claim she made there in front of the home where she had just murdered a noble. So if he was worried, it was because he would actually have held himself to his promise. He was more he was a more honorable noble than most actual nobles. Michelle turned her around firmly but not roughly and shackled her arms behind her. She let him escort her through the late Lord Mainsarai's yard. The other chevaliers formed up around her, wordless. Braille was not sure whether they had been given orders to treat her gently, or if the obviously fine armor told them that she was working for another noble and should not be casually beaten. She very much doubted the code of honor about treatments of prisoners would even apply to elven assassins. Her mind spun new fancies with every step. They had come her they had come here and demanded surrender. This hadn't been about stopping the elves then. If it were, the Chevaliers would simply have killed them. It was about Briala. That explained the light treatment. Could they be with Gaspard? Countering Celine's plan? Unlikely. Sir Michel would never have turned tra traitor, and while Mekinda had lured him out with blackmail once, he was t still too ashamed to allow such a ruse to work twice. They had come from Selene. Had Gaspard done something to force the Empress's hand? Had the Divine made a new demand? What had changed Selene's mind? Then, as she came past the torches, Briaw saw the night sky, glowing a sooty red. She smelled the smoke of Halamsharal's slums burning. After that, Briala stopped thinking. By the time morning came, most of the work was done. Empress Selene rode with her forces on, the sh on her shining white mare, resplendent in royal plate that glittered even in the weak, smoky light of dawn. She ought to be tired, she knew, but even though she was up late this day instead of early, the dawn worked its magic upon her mind keeping her moving. The elves had heard the crash of armor as the army approached, and had tried to form a spear wall using sticks with knives and wooden shields made from tavern tables. The Orlesian army, marching four abreast in the narrow and winding streets of Halam Sharal's slums, had cut them down without even pausing. When they reached an open square, the horsemen had swept out and around in clean, flanking waves, butchering the elves as they tried to flee and terrorize and terrorizing any who thought to gather themselves for a counterattack. After that, Selene's greatest concern was troops losing discipline and turning the night's work into a celebration. The elves lived in these slums, Selene knew, and with nowhere to turn, they would be vicious if given them the chance. She rode along, protected but present, and snapped orders to the men when they seemed inclined to rush into a building for easy looting. They marched through the elven slums with military precision, and when they rode back out, the section claimed by the rebels was burning behind them. The lords and ladies of Halam Sharal were assembled in the upper market square outside the gates that separated the nobles from the presence waiting in silence as Selene and her forces returned. The nobles stood in front, with their bodyguards. The merchants and tradesmen and servants stood off to the side, holding buckets. It was a wise precaution. The heat behind Selene was a blistering curtain that tried to steal the air from her lungs, and sparks and embers drifted freely over the stone walls that kept the nobles safe. 
Those stone walls, Selene thought, likely dated back to when the elves first built Halam Sharal. She wondered if they imagined that one day, those walls would protect human nobility from the elves who burned on the other side. Sir Michel was there with the assembled nobles. Though he had hadn't fought this evening, he looked tired. And as he looked past her at the burning slums, his face gave way some of the sorrow he had tried so hard to deny back in the coach. Celine rode to the front of her forces and took off her helmet. She was bare-faced beneath it, a necessary con concession given the armor, and her pale face met the crowd without flinching. All hail Empress Celine! Sir Michel shouted into the silent square. In the gray dawn light, a thousand voices called her name, and a thousand people dropped to their knees. She sat and allowed it. This was the other reason she had ridden with the forces wearing armor that she had never needed. They would call her cruel, to be certain. They might ask whether she had taken leave of her senses. But she had a thousand living witnesses who knew with undeniable certainty how Empress Selene dealt with the rebellion. The moment wanted a speech, but the words she had prepared didn't fit. Now that the stink of smoke from burning homes was caught in her hair, she turned to Comte Pierre of Halam Sharal, ruler of the city, whom she had allowed to command the forces that raised part of his home. Comte Pierre, she said in a voice that carried to the farthest reaches of the square. My soldiers have traveled long without rest, and while this act of order was necessary, there was no joy in destroying even so humble a part of this fair city. There could only be one acceptable response, and Pierre knew it. We thank you, your majesty, for making our home safe again. And we must again express our sorrow that such base villainy could grow in proud Halam Sharal. There will be work today, Selene said, and soldiers will not make it go faster. We will take our leave and retire to my winter palace outside your fair city. It was a short march to the palace her family had traditionally retired to during the cold winter months, and even after a long night, it would be worth it. Her men would receive better treatment than Halam Sharal could offer, and Halam Sharal could begin burying its dead. Pierre bowed and from the saddle. Pierre bowed from the saddle. Your men are heroes all, your majesty, and we shall see that they dine as such. With your leave, I shall go now to see that the provisions are sent to your palace. Selene nodded, and Comte Pierre rode slowly away, the crowd parting before him. Sir Michel mounted and pulled his horse up beside her, and together they began to ride out of the city. Your duties? Sir Michel, she asked, not looking over. Successful, Empress. A commoner who was with her res resistant was killed. She was taken without a struggle, as you requested. Thank you. The sky had lightened. The banners of the city were slowly, shifting slowly from gray to red. How fares the prisoner? She did not react well to the fire, Empress. I see. Selene nodded, showing nothing, even without her half-mask and makeup. There would be people watching from windows, wanting for a sign of weakness. The sun had risen by the time Selene's forces passed through the city gates, massive and thick. The gates were mounted on ancient stone that was said to come from when the elves had ruled the city. The walls of the city were so strong, according to history, that after the gates had been breached, in the great, last great push of the exalted march, the conquerors had left the fortifications otherwise untouched. It gave the city an unexpected exotic air. The guard towers rising with an ancient grace that was not altogether natural. And it is done, 
Celine said as the sound of her mare's hooves changed from the clop clop of cobblestones to the dull thump of dirt row road. Gaspard's cursed gambit fails. And all of it had cost her was a few thousand elven lives and Briala. Ahead of them, the first merchant caravans of the day already approached the city. It makes little sense, Sir Michelle said behind her. I have been so intent upon finding Briala that I have thought little of Gaspard. But yet to know how easily you would encounter you would counter his false rumors about your sympathy for the knife ears. Did he? Celine shrugged, her fine armor squeaking slightly as he did. He sees that I have never led an army in battle, and thinks I lack the steel to do what must be done. Or he had whispers and innuendo waiting for her back in Val Royale, and she would have to cross blades with him again to quiet whatever little scandal he had prepared this time. No. Michelle frowned. With respect, Empress? For all his buffoonery? Grand Duke Gaspard is a chevalier. He is trained in military strategy. He should have expected this. You are right. Celine yanked on the reins, pulling her horse up short. He did. In the merchant caravan up ahead, Caravan guards threw off brown cloaks to reveal the shining armor of chevaliers. In the grass, hundreds of bowmen rose from where they had lain. As Selene turned to cry a warning for to her forces, the dawn gray sky filled with black arrows. And that was chapter 6 of The Masked Empire.